U.S. AFRICOM has been very, very successful since its inception. It has done a lot of great work uh, building capacity of our, our African partners. And the African partners have changed over the years in a, in a positive way. We have also supported the efforts of our ambassadors throughout the region and have advanced U.S. interests. Part of your mission is to establish military relationships. How do they come into play when you're dealing with insurgent threats like what's in Somalia? You can look at uh, all the, uh, the effectiveness uh, that have been uh, increased in the uh, African partners. So the uh, troop contributing countries in Amazon, which we support the Department of State as they prepare those forces. They have had uh, some significant success against Al-Shabaab and those troop contributing countries have, uh, have performed well. As I understand it, the idea was to help the African militaries establish themselves so that they could take care of crises on the African continent without our help. Right, and it's just, it's about being a professional force in a democracy. Many of our uh, African partners have increased their uh, abilities as militaries, but also, and probably more importantly, to serve their governments and the people. That's changed significantly. We have, you know, numerous examples of that. So AFRICOM has helped to develop democracy on the continent? Every, every time our militaries go out there, whether it be uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, or Coast Guardsmen, they bring a professionalism to them, they bring values, and uh, that example uh, has a major impact on our, our African partners, plus all the training that we do. So you can look at any of the situations from Ebola to the challenges in Boko Haram, and you can see people who have been uh, who have benefited from U.S. training and uh, capacity building efforts working very effectively. AFRICOM has garnered a lot of attention with its reaction to the Ebola crisis. How do emerging health issues impact your strategy? The country of Liberia uh, had that problem down there with the Ebola breakout. It basically shook them to their roots. Their confidence was gone. We went down in support of the USA to support that effort. We actually succeeded beyond most expectations, and not we, but really the Liberian leadership, Liberian people. And then, of course, a, a small but very, very professional armed force of Liberia, which has been built over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And their uh, motto uh, since their inception has, be, has been building a force for good. So that Liberian army was uh, working with us side by side, showed a tremendous amount of confidence and competency, and helped to inspire the people, as well as provided a huge connection between the medical authorities who were working to, to support the people of Liberia. So I assumed you learned a lot from the Ebola crisis. Give me an idea. Uh, one of the biggest things that made a difference, quite frankly, was the Liberian leadership who reached out to the people and said, this is the best way to take care of yourself and your families. And that was one of the biggest things that uh, was a takeaway. And that didn't take any money. That, that took uh, leadership. But to get to that, they had to get some confidence and uh, some ability to understand that they could you know, beat this disease back and, and save their people and, and help themselves. We, of course, provided communications and coordination efforts. So bringing all the people and all the players together and communicating with them, we were able to do that very effectively. We brought uh, engineering uh, expertise out to help them uh, build. And the other thing that's huge is logistics. It's a country that has a underdeveloped infrastructure and to get out to the places where the disease was uh, ravaging the people was, you know, a, a challenge. So that ability to uh, move and ability to logistically support things uh, helped out tremendously. And then we did, this, as we always do, we trained people. We trained over 1,500 healthcare workers who are out there today, you know, making a difference for Liberia and the people. But we took the strengths of the military and, of course, the biggest one was speed was to be able to get there quickly and uh, get out to the places that needed to help or get the Liberian uh, medical people, the international medical people out to where they needed to help the people. So there were a lot of good lessons from that. As always, when you, uh, you do something like that, you, get a, you uh, have a learning curve, but uh, the military is a pretty doggone good learning organization, so we, we learn fast. For you personally, what has been the biggest learning curve? to understand the people, to understand how they, uh, uh, what their values are, and understand the situation is probably the biggest learning curve. It's huge, it's diverse, you know, it's got over a thousand languages, multi-ethnic backgrounds, and, uh, you know, to understand those things is, uh, is the biggest learning curve. Other flashpoints we have on the continent are Boko Haram, ISIS. How is AFRICOM involved 
in fighting these violent insurgents. In the Boko Haram piece, the, uh, the three countries that are working outside of uh, Nigeria to, uh, to help contain the threat of Boko Haram, the forces that are doing the work in Cameroon are, uh, for, are the Rapid Intervention Brigade, and that's, we've had a long-standing relationship with them. The Cameroonian military that is uh, taking the fight to Boko Haram is the, from the Special Anti-Terrorism Group, another long-term relationship we've had that uh, they've built their capacity. The Nigerians, the, uh, the colonel who's leading, went back to one of our war colleges for training, and uh, he's leading the effort. So, uh, so it's a combination of those things. Are we doing enough? That's a, a great question. Um, you know, the trans-regional threats and the complex terrorist networks and the criminal networks, you know, that, that requires a whole host of things. Uh, and then, of course, you need a, a willing uh, and able leadership in the country to make a difference uh, that's all a part of it. You know, the trans-regional criminal and terrorist network continues to grow. We've supported the Africans in successes in that in some areas. In uh, other areas, uh, you know, the Africans have not been as successful, so, such as uh, Libya. There are reports recently that seem to indicate that AFRICOM has become more willing to engage in combat operations. All that is really, you know, based on the situations out there and what's needed. The, uh, the way we work with all the African nations out there is it's really a demand-based uh, operation. So what they need is what the things that we help them with. And that's what, uh, what's most important for how we fit in and what we uh, do uh, in our role as uh, a military. So how does this reflect your recent posture statement to reduce risk for U.S. personnel and our facilities? On the reducing risk in personnel and uh, facilities uh, throughout the African continent, as you know, because of the vast continent, you're uh, really concerned about the distances. And so what we have done in, in, in support of mainly the State Department, who has the primary responsibility to protect the uh, embassies and the personnel abroad, we have uh, developed uh, cooperative security locations, uh, which we can then uh, move to based on indications and warning. Uh, so that we can get close enough uh, and much closer than we've had in the past to be able to support them as the situation uh, is uh, requires. So are these staging areas like pre-position sites? A uh, cooperative security location is just a, uh, a, small, uh, a small location where we could come in. It's got a couple warehouses. We have um, contractors that are prepared to come and uh, help us out. And then when the, uh, when the requirement is to get down to move closer to one of these trouble areas, then we move in, uh, put up a bunch of tents, and, uh, and prepare to support the embassy. So it's a, it's a, it would be what you would call a very austere location with a couple of warehouses that has things like tents, water, and, and, uh, and things like that. I'm curious, does the security for these installations fall under the contractors also? Security for those are, are really done by the host nation. The security of the individual site itself, uh, where they are, is, that's not a problem. Well, that implies a lot of trust. That's a great point because, uh, you know, the, the places where we go and the teams that we work with, the people who secure us are our partners. We work with the African people, we work with the African militaries, and we support the efforts of the country teams who are really leading that effort. Uh, but it's important for us to understand, you know, what, uh, what that level of poverty is and, and how the th actions we take do have an impact on it. So, for example, in the Ebola uh, effort, one of the biggest things we wanted to make sure we did is as we went down and contracted a bunch of significant support, that we did it at the same level that the nation does it. When you're in a hurry, as you can imagine, uh, we spend a lot of money to get things done fast. And when you go fast, sometimes you make mistakes. So I think we did a tremendous job from the very beginning in Liberia to make sure that what we were paying people was in accordance with their pay scales and was right for that level of uh, population. It's not something I would normally equate to a military command. No, it's not. It's not. It's not something that we normally think about because, again, we're so task oriented that you know we we rush on. And, but uh, those things are usually important because, again, we're uh, part of a microcosm of what's happened in that nation at that time. Is everything you do in Africa guided by the State Department? Yes.
What defines good interagency partnerships with state and other government agencies? The, the first and most important thing is that most of our efforts out on the continent are built and designed and worked in conjunction with the country team, who's a already built and well-coordinated interagency team. Probably the best place the interagency team cooperates because they live together, they work together in a place that they all want to see succeed. The other thing, of course, is our, our relationship with uh, Maine State. So we have a great relationship with Maine State and uh, USAID, and we uh, continue to uh, communicate with them. And we have multiple meetings throughout the year and, and gatherings where we work together with, uh, with them to make sure that we're all one team as a, a broad interagency. Are most of the ambassadors supportive of your efforts? We're supportive of the ambassadors' efforts. <laughs> so. Uh, um, uh, yeah, and as we, we, we are, because again, they're, they're leading the efforts for the U.S. Uh, policy throughout uh, Africa. And we, of course, as you know, have a big interagency uh, part of our staff here. So the deputy here is a, is a former ambassador. Our outreach in the section in the J-9 is also a former ambassador. And then we have a lot of foreign service officers integrated throughout the staff here to be, uh, be part of that team. How do you determine what U.S. military to use in your programs and initiatives and exercises? The majority of the African nations, uh, they have a, a heavy emphasis on ground troops. So that's why uh, the Army and the, the Marines do quite a bit of work there. And then for their air forces, it's more uh, an air force that does mobility and logistics. It's based on the demands that uh, they need and where they want to do it. When you look at many of the African navies, they would probably be more akin to some of our Coast Guard. So it's really, like I said, it's a demand-based thing, and those ambassadors lead those efforts and, and coordinate with uh, the, the militaries and how they want us to support them, and that's how we do it. How do the African governments factor into these programs, initiatives, exercises, training events? Well, the uh, African uh, governments, uh, their, their primary desire is really to have a professional military that supports the uh, governments. Bang, 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 bang! But each of our... Uh, ambassadors who lead that government to government uh, interaction and everything you know they they talk to them and they you know work with them because a lot of things we do here is about listening so we just have to listen to what uh, what they want and what they need because uh, like I said they probably know a little bit better what they need than we do in most cases sir many of you and your team came to AFRICOM with the experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan how do you apply those experiences to this job here. Each time you go through experiences like that, you, you learn a lot. Rear thrust. The efforts that uh, we're doing here to get the Africans to solve their problems and figure out how to enable that the best we can is uh, the same thing we're trying to do in uh, Afghanistan. Different time, a different place, but uh, many of the principles are the same. And again, a professional military that serves its government and serves its people is uh, what, uh, what everybody in the world wants. Building partner capacity is a key objective for AFRICOM on the continent. How do you use American military forces to accomplish it? Is, is it one-on-one -on -one or is it uh, platoon by platoon? Or? It's all those things and both. You know, of course, a lot of it is the leader development piece that's usually important. But that, that will come on that prevail because this we do that by uh, either sending people back to do training in the United States, which is a big part of it. But also, we uh, we do a lot of training. Whether you look at the exercises or whether you look at the programs that we have to build those militaries, and they're trained in everything from. Uh, preventative health to the rule of law, how you integrate uh, women into uh, you know their activities, you know all those things are a part of what we train them in. Are all the militaries receptive? In most cases, like I said, first of all, it's demand driven, and second of all, yes, when we when we go down there, we we bring a lot of things that uh, they would like to become. Green one, cast six, sit rep over. Sometimes I tell the people the biggest thing you bring to the uh, African militaries as you get in there are your values. They see how you operate, they see how you treat people, and uh, they, uh, they want to be like, uh, like that. There are some 53 countries within your area of operation, five regions. AFRICOM has, at the last count, relations with more than 40. We have relations with all of them. They're different, uh, uh, different levels. Some of them are absolutely uh, you know very very effective in their capabilities and they're very willing 
Uh, others, you know, uh, with, you know, based on history, still keep us at arm's length. You know, so we, we work through all those things. So where do you get your manpower to maintain enduring connections? We have um, uh, state partnership programs that are hugely important. We've increased that in the last couple of years. So that's a long-term relationship building capacity. It's very good. As you know, we have uh, the people down at Djibouti that have long-term relationships. The uh, defense attache offices and the Office of Security Cooperation where we in each of the, in each of the country teams. And then we have a whole host of uh, people, not only here at AFRICOM, but uh, at all our component commands. They're out there all the time uh, building relationships and, uh, and, and building that trust and confidence. It's so important. The uh, regional line force from the Army, the uh, Marines come from a special purpose MAGTAF, and then the Air Forces uh, uh, come from, uh, from both Europe as well as back in the States as required to support the efforts. Africa is huge. It's composed of different geographic regions, a variety of economic associations, there are military unions. It's very complex. What's your primary challenge? The primary challenge, you know, at, at all those times is really uh, just understand the complex situations that are out there and then how to best support them. You know, when you uh, uh, were looking at uh, Afghanistan, you were looking at one nation. Uh, here we're looking at uh, 53. And, uh, and some of them have challenges just as tough. And, uh, and then the other piece is just uh, understanding the capabilities, uh, the current capabilities of what they're working with, so. But you're also factoring that with our own national security desires. Yes, yes. But you know, at the end of the day, it's really, a, a, again, a stable and prosperous uh, Africa that you know, is part of the international community and contributes to the, uh, the international system. So the objectives are all kind of the same, of course, you know, it's important to, uh, to understand in Africa, you know, that, you know, six of the top ten, you know, growing economies are in Africa. In our interconnected world, there's connections between uh, every, uh, every country, you know, that uh, go beyond what uh, we've thought about in the past. Sir, I'm curious, what about the impact of social media in Africa? The social media is, uh, is just like everywhere else, a hugely interesting phenomena. It has provided a, a huge... Um, situational awareness to people who out of a phone. It has increased the demands for, from the people for their governments to be more accountable. There are some things, obviously, you can use it good or, or uh, you can use it bad, but, uh, but for the most part, you know, it has raised the level of awareness of uh, populations about things in, uh, happening in Africa and the world, and they have uh, demanded more of their uh, governments to, uh, to take care of them better. How does social media factor into your strategic objectives? Part of the situational understanding is the role really of the government, the security forces, and the people. That interaction, if it's all working together as a team, things usually happen pretty good. It uh, you know, provides you a, uh, the heartbeat of what the population's thinking about. What's next, sir? What can we expect from Africa and from Africa? On the security uh, home front, the, the challenges of the transnational uh, uh, both criminal and terrorist networks are the things that are uh, really uh, destabilizing the countries that are being challenged right now. So I think that we have to uh, look at that uh, broadly rather than individually in one country. So the, the problems that you have in, uh, in Libya today are not just from internal to the country, but they have many external uh, connections. So I think that we have to, to continue to look uh, at a broader array of solutions. And I also ha think that we have to look uh, long term because you can imagine uh, we get caught up in the short term all the time. And uh, these are really, you know, long term efforts that, uh, you know, hope we hope that in 20 or 30 years we'll have a more stable and prosperous Africa. But you read the headlines today, they all seem to indicate that Africa remains a dangerous place. Well, there are places in Africa, but again, if you look at all 53 of them, if you look back 20 or 30 years, uh, Africa was much less stable, was not, uh, didn't have these booming economies, didn't have this uh, educated class of people that could uh, lead them into the future. In the most part, that's been moving in a positive direction. So is AFRICOM making a difference? Yes, yes, AFRICOM is definitely making a difference.